hope you had an enjoyable day at the conference. Um, it's, it's a, it is a pleasure to introduce our university president, Father Dennis Holtschneider. As chair of the Board of Ascension Health, the nation's largest Catholic and nonprofit health system, he is more than familiar with the topics we have been discussing today. Father Holtschneider has played a key role in the expansion of health programs at DePaul and our strategic alliance with Rush University. We are very happy you could be here today. Please join me in welcoming Father Holtschneider. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Huh? That was better than church. <laughs> it's, really, uh, it's really nice to be with you today and to welcome you to our home here at DePaul University. Um, we're actually honored and we're proud that uh, you would bring these conversations here um, because, frankly, they're close to our heart as a, as a university. Um, this, uh, this Sunday evening, if you were to go up to a uh, division in California up in Humboldt Park, um, you would, uh, between the hours of four and six, you would see nurse practitioners and registered nurses volunteering, along with other health professionals, to offer health care services to Chicago's homeless and those in most need. Um, if, you, uh, if you stick around a little later and then you follow them to a CERMAC, uh, down at the Loomis area in Pilsen. Um, you'll find them reaching out there. Um, five days a week, from Sunday to Thursday, the Night Ministry's 38-foot health outreach bus makes its rounds to neighborhoods across the city, from Wicker Park to Pilsen and beyond. And inside that Night Ministry bus, nurses offer free health services, such as adult immunizations, and foot care, pregnancy testing, rapid HIV testing, screening for chronic health problems, and much more. Um, a faculty member in our School of Nursing here at DePaul regularly volunteers on that night ministry, and I'm guessing that some of you sitting in this room likely do as well or have, either for that charity or for other similar ones. Why do people volunteer their expertise in those situations? Why have you chosen the field of public health and all the questions that come with it. Because there's a structural problem to solve and because you have good hearts, both. You believe that access to quality health care is a human right, not just a nice thing for society to have, a human right. And you work your heart out for that. But we don't live in a social situation where everyone believes it's a human right, or even that our official structures currently believe it's a human right. It's parceled out, and often, as you know, parceled out unevenly to those who can afford to get more, and those often in most need, and especially in most need of health care, um, are unable to access it. And so you give your lives to it. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't care about those who are in incredible need and didn't have easy opportunities. You want to make that difference. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, is there a nurse in the house? <laughs> I have a bit of a cough. Um, St. Vincent de Paul, whose name is on our doors, lived 400 years ago. But he lived at a time where there were three wars, and all the poverty that was out in the rural regions of France flooded Paris. And he and his colleague, who became St. Louis de Marriac, had to figure out how they created social systems to take care of the poor in an urban environment. That was their challenge in their day. And so they had to figure out how you do, um, how you rethink issues of criminal justice, how you do food distribution, how you do educational opportunities, how you do housing, but also how you do health care. And they worked their hearts out trying to figure out how do you provide health care to the poor. And so he left us along a group of priests like myself to continue to think about how poverty is addressed in this world, but also what became the largest group of Catholic nuns in the world to this day, the Daughters of Charity, who have created enormous and extraordinary health systems themselves, and then banded those together with many other of the Catholic health systems that today serve one out of six Americans for their health care in the U.S. Um, you heard that I have the privilege at this moment to be chair of Ascension Health. And 
we spend most every board meeting thinking about how we're going to take care of those who present themselves and can't afford to do so. We provide actually $1.8 billion a year through our health system for the needs of the poor and community benefit programs. And yet, what we feel most is not how much what we do. What we feel most is this a society with the ever more presenting need that isn't helping us to reach out to that need. And we find ourselves stretched and tugged and pulled to how to make that happen day after day. And of course, that's your question too, isn't it? It's if you feel the tug and the pull of need that's not being addressed. And why? Because there's a structural problem that's not being addressed in our society's structures when it comes to taking care of the needs of those who present themselves. And so, I stand here today with great respect for each one of you, and honored, frankly, to be here, and honored that DePaul can host your conversations. Um, and honored, frankly, that DePaul University gets to think through these questions with an organization um, like Rush um, and its uh, medical school. It's, a, um, it's an extraordinary institution that also has a heart for those in need. And it's a, it's a new relationship for us as a university. Um, we're creating ma um, master's entry to nursing practices for non-nurses. Um, we're creating programs um, that allow students uh, to work together on public health issues. Our sociology, our public health programs are collaborating on these issues of disparity. We're trying to create programs for students to actually to move directly into health careers, many of them. We're doing certificates now at Rush to help their um, members of their community with health law, health, public health, health sector management programs. Um, our College of Science and Health is working with them to create pathway programs to master's programs in healthcare for our health science majors. Um, together, we're trying to think through many different aspects of how we prepare people to go into a world of extraordinary need and to do so at the highest levels of the profession. Um, and so it gives us honor today to welcome them, Dr. David Ansel, a physician at Rush, and certainly possesses the heart and the expertise for the work that we're examining and we're concerned with. He's dedicated his life, his work, his advocacy, his research to the idea that health care is a basic human right. And he's all too familiar with the inequities that we know very well in Chicago. He witnessed them every day during his 17 years at Cook County Hospital, which he documented in his book, County, Life, Death, and Politics at Chicago's Public Hospital. He focused his career, both as a physician and a social epidemiologist, on addressing poverty and racism. He's been particularly active in the fight to reduce breast cancer mortality inequality in Chicago. In 1983, he created the Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program at Cook County Hospital. He currently serves as the board chair of the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force, a nonprofit group that's focused on the quality of breast care in the region. It is our honor, more than ever, for the questions that he raises and that the attention uh, to which he insists be given to the needs of our brothers and sisters in this community that make us most honored to welcome him into this room and into your conversation today. Um, I pray that God continues to bless his work and continues to bless all of you so that through all of us, um, our brothers and sisters in need in the city might find someone who truly cares and can help. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. David Ann. amazing product. <laughs> that was better than my mother would do. <laughs> Actually, I started my healthcare career at 16 years old at a, a Daughters of Charity Hospital in Binghamton, New York, Our Lady of Lourdes, and I was really taught by the nuns uh, how to behave. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I haven't always followed those things. It didn't work for me either. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really grateful to be here today and um, speak to you. I want to thank the leaders of DePaul for joining with Rush in this new Center for Community Health Equity. <clears throat> and I think we've got a great potential by linking 
our institutions together, but the, not the institutions, the people, in trying to solve uh, the big problems of our, our day. I, I'm personally thrilled to be working with Fernando and John uh, on this. But I stand today before you in the spirit of American promises unfulfilled. And I'm wondering, is there a clicker here for me to move slides, or do I, do I do something as crazy as walk over here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll stand over here. Can you hear me, everybody? You can take the mic with you. Oh, that's even better. I just want to be able to uh, multitask while I'm up here. But I want to say I stand to you today in front of you in the spirit of American promises that are unfulfilled. Promises that were written in the Declaration of Independence that inspired people around the world. The notion that we're all possessed with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And these can't be abrogated by laws of men and women. They are actually uh, given to us. These promises are unfulfilled in this country because this country was built on 250 years of a cancerous institution, slavery, followed by a 90-year history of legalized segregation in this country. That was j until just about 40 years ago when these faulty foundations came down because of public protests uh, that we are where we are today. But if we're to proceed with this work in the 21st century, we need to speak honestly and directly about racism and its continued grip on society. And I gotta tell you, I'm speaking from a position of privilege when I speak about this. I never have experienced myself, I've been a witness to it. And so I can't speak as honestly and truthfully as I would if I left it, but these, I'm going to today spend some time with you. I want to tell you my perspective on this, and I'm going to now in this talk, I do a talk in three parts, because if you don't like the one part, the next part will be coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> and by the end, the end's coming. <laughs> part one, I just entitled, I Can't Breathe, because I thought, wow, those, that's really powerful words. Part two, I call it murder, which is the name of a BBC documentary in 1979. You can look at it online. Uh, it's, it's on YouTube. When the BBC came to say what was healthcare in America like, and came to Cook County Hospital when I was an intern. And the part three is about what can we do, all of us individually, to overcome uh, the condition I call disparity, the despair gap. And uh, we'll hopefully have a dialogue uh, about this. My goal today, when I come in front of a room, is to convince three people in a room this size, and maybe a couple of you out in the hall, <laughs> that something that you will actually become activated. Not only, not that your mind, something's going to get changed in your mind, but something's going to change in what you do as a result of this. And the reason why I say three people in a room this big because most of us sit by as quiet witnesses to what goes on around us, uh, and we tolerate it. And I'm a patient safety guy in the hospital world, and what we say is what we tolerate, we promote. And I'm going to show you some of the things we're tolerating. But to actually activate yourself means activating the thoughts in your brain to come to your voices, and then activate us to take action. If I get three of you in this room activated today, I would have felt, gosh, I've done my job. So I'm just going to start with pictures because images are very powerful in the world. And I want to start with a, uh, a few images that have moved me. And this is a, uh, an image from my childhood. Uh, my parents were immigrants from Europe. My mother's family, my parents were from England. My mother's family was all in Poland and they were all wiped out in the Holocaust. And so being an immigrant in saying what a great country this is with the Declaration of Independence and all those words, you know, you also have this legacy of what we left behind there. And every Passover, Passover, the Jewish holiday where one celebrates with your family, 
It's a family holiday around the dining room table with guests where you celebrate freedom from slavery. My dad had a folded up newspaper picture in the, the Haggadah, the prayer book, and he'd bring it out every Passover, and it was this picture. And he did a blessing to commemorate the kids, the children. And as a young boy, I looked at this young boy with his hands up, and these were being routed by, out of their homes by the Nazis to death camps. And I identified with the, what that must have felt like uh, for a, a young boy. And I thought as a kid, as a young kid, I could understand people with guns driving you in a certain direction. But where were the neighbors? And in my own voice as a shy little kid, I, I, in my own head I said, someone wants to figure out how to find a voice for this. Uh, and then, this is when I was activated, the next picture. So this was 50 years ago. And I was a reader, it was on the news, and this was the first attempt to march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery 50 years ago. So the movie, movie Selma now is out. But I remember, I was almost 13 years old, and I, this was in the newspaper, and I'm sh this looked to me like Nazi Germany. As a kid, in my adopted country, where I thought we'd be safe. And what happened was 600 civil rights marchers, led by John Lewis, who's now a congressman from Georgia, he was the leader of a student nonviolent coordinating committee, decided to march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, 54 miles away, walk, it takes five days, peacefully, for the right to vote. And uh, when they uh, walked across the bridge, tear gap, tear, uh, the state police with tear, uh, tear uh, gas masks, batons, horses, tear gassed them, attacked them, and this was the on the news. It actually activated a lot of people in America. This was a, a major turning point in this country's history. Uh, and for me as a kid, I, it was like, okay, I have to go in a certain direction. And this motivated me to do this. And uh, you see John Lewis's hands, just like the hands of that child in that other picture, his, his hands up, uh, being deliberately beaten because he was the leader of this nonviolent march. We all know this picture. I can't breathe, it's 18 times. So here's a man standing on the sidewalk. He's selling selfies, uh, singles, and Mind, you know, sort of minding his own business, and the police come and the police come up to him. He says, "Leave me alone! Leave me alone! You know, you're always harassing me." And then they take him down and get him in a chokehold, puts handcuffs him, get on his back. I can't breathe 18 times. Leaves him on the ground and doesn't do CPR. The New York uh, medical examiner says it's homicide. The grand jury says, you know, he was resisting arrest. In response to this. Uh, many things happen around the country, but the medical students and nursing students around the country held demonstrations, and they're called White Coat Black Lives, and I went out with our medical students, 70 medical schools went out and lay on the ground wherever they went in commemoration of Garner and Walker, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, uh, and at Rush Medical School there was a blowback from people who said, what did this have to do with public health? And if you watch Fox News on this as well, you realize, boy, this country is very divided on whether this was a terrible thing that happened or, you know, well, what do these guys get if they're resisting arrest? Do you know what I mean? This is, the, this is what we heard about it, and I had to reflect on that. And I'm just going to show you one other picture here. Look at how the police have changed now. They're like the military. This is Ferguson. Hands up. But now M16s pointed at you on the street, in the streets of our country. There's a huge urgency around this message. And I had to reflect on this, is because people were saying, even in my work, I said, well, why, what do you think about this? Well, you know, why did they resist arrest and do this thing? Well, data. So this is why you've got to go now to data and look at data. It turns out that you ask black youth about the police and 70% say they mistrust the police. Whereas if you let, ask a white youth about it, it's about 20% mistrust the police. 
And if you get stopped by the police, blacks are four times more likely to get arrested. Black, blacks are 21 times more likely than whites to be shot by the police. So what's the normal reaction, I would think, based on the data? If you're black, what should you do? I would try to avoid any contact with the police, anything, because I'm going to be more likely to get arrested, more likely to get shot. The data shows it. So I want to show you some more data here. So there's been an epidemic in our country, and an epidemic is something we've tolerated. And, it's the, and, and I'll call it, I didn't come up with this name, my friend Steve Whitman had a Tribune article in the 1980s about this. It's the crime of black imprisonment. And I'm raising this issue because it's a public health emergency. And to not speak about this uh, would, would be wrong in a talk about public health. So I want to just show you what's happened in this country. So we ended legalized segregation really right about 1970. And we've substituted now something in this country which is something called mass imprisonment. So there's reasons behind it. But then in the root cause of this, you could say there's many root causes. Uh, but I want to go through the data for you on it. But one of the, so we had changes in laws about drug crimes. So petty drug uh, crimes became reasons to be, went from misdemeanors to felonies. And then you had three strikes, you're out policies. And that meant three strikes, you got felony for life. And in places like Alabama, where you, once you have a felony conviction, you can no longer vote. In a few years, there'll be more black men who've been, had the vote taken away from them than before the Voting Rights Act. So this has been a way to actually take the franchise away from black men in this country. It's been used in this way. I'm saying this as a white man observer of this, this stuff. I, I'm just looking at this. Look at that epidemic curve there. If this was the flu or the measles, we'd all want to get immunized, right? This is an epidemic. And look when it happens, is right at the end of the civil rights movement. Now, I'm not saying cause and effect, but it's kind of coincidence. You know, stop and frisk, who knows what stop and frisk policy is? You know, you look suspicious to me, so I'm going to stop and frisk you. Well, blacks are way more likely, to get, and Latinos, way more likely to be stopped and frisked than, I've never been stopped and frisked. So we're now the world's largest jailer, way above more Russia, South Africa, China. We used to be down where Japan and uh, where Canada and Europe was. And look where we've jumped. And here's the other fact of this. Who are we jailing? So this is a fact. So, so you know, and look at the rate differences. So more, actually, this is bad for white people too, because more white people are going to jail. But it's actually, you can see, there's a disparity here in these numbers. These are the facts. These are just, they're not my facts. They're, the, they're America's facts uh, that, we, that we do this. I have a paper, it's going to be in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's about implicit bias. And I decided to count how many, how many medical, black male medical students there are in the class of 211 in the United States. You can go online and do this and calculate this. But there's about a million black men in prison in the United States. And in 2011, in the group that's called black or African American, I want to say both those things, because some of these are Africans, and some are Caribbeans, okay, so they're not all, I'm not criticizing the category, I'm just saying that of that category, about a little more than half are African American being born in this country, African Americans, 444 black medical students. Oh, but there must have been a reason for this, right? Because, because that's the Fox News thing, or what we say, we say, well, People are committing these crimes, they're doing this stuff, and yeah, okay, that's what's going on. People are actually committing these violent crimes, right? And that's why we had to arrest so many people, because it was criminal activity. So that's what crime did. This is violent crime during that same period. Flat or went down. Okay. So, if it's not violent crime, 
It must be how people feel about crime, right? Because it's not real violent crime. It's what people feel about crime. And this is a graph. On a lower graph, you ask people, how serious is crime in your area? And this is looking across Gallup poll across the United States, 2001 to 2011, not too serious, right? Only 10% say it's serious. Then you ask them, how serious is the crime in the rest of the United States? They think it's pretty high. So it turns out that most of the reason that people are in jail for petty crimes is, is like the move, is like Lay Miz stealing a loaf of bread stuff. Crimes against, you know, minor drug crimes and uh, uh, crimes against poverty. Uh, this, is the dis this is the disparity gap. These are the, the black line are black arrest rates, the pink line are white arrest rates for marijuana. And you see the number of the biggest in the country? Do you see that, people? Cook County. Now, I brought it to a college uh, because I, you guys are subject matter experts in this, this uh, arena here. But think about stop and frisk. If you're more likely to be stop and frisk, they're more likely to find something, you're more likely to be arrested. Um, but you could say, well, gosh. You look at this and say, it could be they're being arrested more because they're black, but I bet you it's arrested more because they're doing more pot. That's what it is, right? <laughs> oh, there's the pot smoking race. <laughs> I mean, I'm weaving the web here, people. What's the spider? What's the spider in this web? Okay, this is just a throw in. Look at the gap. And uh, When you put people in prison, when you take young men, so it turns out in Chicago, one in three young black men will spend some time in their lifetime in prison right now in Chicago. Actually, in the United States, one in three black men will spend some of their time in connection with the criminal justice system, parole, this, that, and the other. When you take men out of a community, you take wages out of the community, you have children without fathers, you have single mothers, uh, I, I'm getting to health. You, when they get out, they can't get jobs uh, because you have to fill out the piece of paper, you ever had a criminal record, and of course if one in three does, you can't even get a job. Uh, and look at the income gap here. It's because people just don't know how to work. That must explain this. Look at the gap, in, and it's the biggest gap we've ever had in the United States between black and white wealth. And this was a uh, report from the Vera Institute, as you can look at it online, that said in mass incarceration is a public health disaster. Because not only do people go to prison, die younger, but the impact on their families and their communities is huge. All right, bias. You know, when uh, Ferguson, Garner, this thing like this, where all the talk about we're not racist in this country. So I want to talk to you about the literature. This is uh, uh, a group of faces, and intermixed in here are white and black faces. Well, they've come up with this test. Have anyone heard the implicit association test? You can do it online if you, if you want. Uh, but the implicit association test, what they do is you'll, you'll, you'll put uh, a white face up, and you'll have a list of words, flower, honey, Sweetness, you know, and you pick the you you very quickly go through this test and associate faces with words, and it turns out that when Americans do this, so the the literature on bias is that explicit bias in this country, which was quite frequent and prevalent, is less than it used to be. I would argue with that myself, but let's just say the percentage is ten to fifteen percent. But that implicit bias, preference for white. When people who do this implicit test is 70%. And actually, even among black people, the preference right is around 50%. Because we live in a society where your, your, your reminders are always negative about people of color. And your reminders of white are always, this is supposed to be good, and this is unconscious. And so the way you react unconsciously is this unsafe. I get the story about moving into Oak Park and I was a county doc, we could afford the first house into Oak Park, it's right next to Austin, 
on, uh, on Humphrey Street, and my mother-in-law was there, saw a black person walking down the street, said, oh, you don't want to live here. Yeah. That's my mother-in-law. And of course, we lived there, and it was perfect. But I think the fact is, unconsciously, that meant bad. But this is America, and it means bad. So I wanted to show you something, uh, how true this is. So, Hurricane Katrina. So on the same day in Hurricane Katrina, there are people wading through uh, chest deep water. And on the top is a guy with a pampers and a bag full of food. And uh, desperate, of course, you know, people are stuck in New Orleans. And it says a young man walks through a chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store. And down below, another couple, uh, he's got a backpack on, she's schlucking a loaf of bread. And it says, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread. <laughs> it's funny, but it's horrible. I'm just saying, as this exists in us, and these were not bad people. That's just what they go to. That's just what they go to. And to think it's not affecting our outcomes, I call it murder. So, County, I'm going to spend a little bit of time about my path and how I understood how bad it is and why I come out every opportunity to speak to groups to try to find three people who will get activated to do something, meaning to speak up. Because and this, is, this is for white people in this room. It's our job to speak up about this. When Nazi Germany, the Jews couldn't speak up. It needed to be the Germans to speak up. This is for the white people in the room, really. We have to speak up about this. I call it murder. So my parents came from England, all my relatives there. I'm at Cook County Hospital doing an internship. And the BBC came to do this story. And they asked the doctor, Dr. Linda Ray Murray, who's the, you may know, she's the, the uh, wonderful doctor, wonderful person. She's the CMO of the Cook County Department of Public Health. She was an intern or a, a year ahead of me in residency. And they asked her, as they rolled people in from other hospitals, one hospital after another, because there was a time in Chicago where there were only two hospitals that black people could go to, Cook County and Providence. Mm -hmm. And if you had no insurance, you just got put on an ambulance and moved to Cook County Hospital. And they asked, How, what do you call this? And she said, I don't know about you, but I call it murder. You can YouTube this tonight when you get pizza. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's, worth, it's worth watching. It's really worth watching. Uh, but my relatives started calling my mother, asking if I was okay uh, after this. But, uh, but, you know, I want to just go back to myself now. I'm in medical school, and I decided to be a doctor because I wanted to do good to people. I'm that little hairy creature down in the middle. Of the <laughs> and uh, I was very distraught in medical school because the curriculum, because we were learning about disease. But somehow there was a disconnect between what I saw is the structural causes of illness in the country. You know, the things that were really, but we're not taught, weren't part of it. In fact, I was so distraught that I was in Syracuse, New York. They had a forestry school. I applied to forestry school. I was a tree hugger back in those days. <laughs> and, but I walked myself back from the edge of the woods, and I found a group of students like me. We studied the U.S. healthcare system and said, wow, is this ever a mess? It's terrible. And, but we decided, uh, my, my struggle at that time was not what I wanted to be. I knew I wanted to be a doctor, <coughs> but I was struggling around purpose. Why? Why? And I think that if, when you can figure this out in your lives, why you're doing it, everything follows them. So I figured out my why. And I was influenced by this guy who was around in the late 1840s, a guy named Rudolf Virchow. And Virchow was a doctor in Germany who was asked to go investigate an outbreak of typhus, an infectious disease, in a region of Germany that was incredibly poor. And he came back and he wrote a report, or tried to write a report, and said that the reason for typhus in Silesia was the lack of democracy in Silesia. And 
he didn't get to write his report. <laughs> he also said uh, the, that doctors were the natural attorneys for the poor because when you're face to face with that patient, or nurses as well, that you actually have to advocate on their behalf. And to advocate on their behalf, sometimes you have to advocate on behalf of the whole community because that one person is a reflection of everything in the community. So we figured healthcare was a human right and there was only one place to come and train, and this was at the, at the front lines of that fight in those days, Cook County Hospital. Anyone ever been there? I had a patient a uh, number of years. When I was at Rush, I just got to Rush, and I had a patient, an African-American guy, south side of Chicago. He had the same birthday as me. I never had someone, the same birthday, same year. First time that ever happened to me. And I said, that's really strange. We have the same birthday. He looked at me and said, were you born at a county hospital? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because the fact of the matter was, there was a time when if you were black in Chicago, the only place you could live or die was county hospital, Provident Hospital. So we went there. It was the front lines of everything that's wrong in healthcare. It still is today. Thank God it's still open. And, but we had to fight to keep it open. So this is the speaking up part. You know, it's one thing to go to county or go to a place, open the door, walk in, and say, I'm going to be a doctor or a nurse there. But if you let it be the way it was going to be without trying to improve it or change it, you're a part of it. So we were fight we learned that we had to speak up. I call this doctors within borders. <laughs> we had a, we actually had a printing press, we made we made posters and signs, and we would see our patients in the morning, take the L downtown do a protest, keep county open, come back and see our patients in the afternoon. One day the, we didn't get paychecks. They shut off the money to county, and so uh, someone had a rally and said, what should we do with the patients? Let's take them over to Rush, someone said. And that was from the Tribune of rolling the patients over to Rush. <laughs> Something that one should never do. I mean, I, but uh, but I, the point was we felt so helpless that what else could we do? And the, we knew these other hospitals wouldn't take wouldn't take the patients. <clears throat> so I got involved with something. This got me involved more actively in public health. This idea of patient dumping. The idea you could dump a patient from one hospital to another simply because they had no insurance. And this is from the Sun-Times uh, showing a, a dump truck full of patients being dumped at county. Of course, you know, these patients were all black and Latino for the most part. Uh, so they're all minority patients. No surprise, but unspoken. And what would happen would be like this. You'd be in the emergency room and the phone would ring. And you'd be standing there. There was no rules in the county emergency room. The phone would ring and you'd go pick up the phone. And then you'd get on the phone and say, hello, who is it? And they say, it's University of Chicago Hospital. We want to transfer your patient. Next to the phone was a clipboard with a pencil tied to it to the county. If you didn't tie it down, it'd walk out. <laughs> and there was a little checklist, name of the patient, date of birth, vital signs, and then there was a bunch of check boxes, reason for transfer. And what do you think the reason for transfer was? No insurance. No insurance. Yes, 100% time. No insurance. So I always thought we were kind of high and mighty. You know, we were in the moral high ground of county because we were there taking the poor of the city. But then I thought about who was on the other side of the phone. It was someone just like me. They were someone who had gone to medical school. They just happened to go to the University of Chicago or some other hospital. And they told them there, if someone shows up with no insurance, this is what you're supposed to do. And this is how the game worked. As long as I accepted the patient, their administrator said, we can't take an uninsured patient. So, okay. Then send them to county. It depended on me saying yes. That's how the system works. One person does it, the other one does it in unison. When we stop doing it, when we say no, that's when it stops. So we decided we would do a study on this uh, problem, and we tracked 500 patients. And we just asked them when they came in, what happened, what did they tell you at the other hospital? What do you think the person like me told the, think about this, you're now me, you're a young person, you're a nice person, and you're told by your administrator, call up and send this patient to county hospital. What would you tell the patient the reason is? No beds at our hospital, better doctors, better care. But they never said no insurance because they didn't want to be they didn't want to be put in that situation. 
they, they, moral ambiguity was okay for them. But actually it was okay for us too because we just accepted these patients. So here's what we found. 500 patients, uh, no one got informed consent, they were always told other things, 25% ended up in an ICU, and there was a higher death rate. But what's really more important than even all that were the stories. So we randomly picked some of the stories, like this, gunshot wound to the head, on a ventilator, transfer to Cook County Hospital, reason for transfer, no insurance. Or this one, this is from West Suburban Hospital from my fair uh, town of Oak Park, Illinois. Woman in terminal stages of labor, breech delivery, 10 centimeters di dilated, foot in the vagina, <clears throat> transfer to county, no insurance. Now what do you think the response was at county when people heard we were doing a study like this? They were angry. People were angry at us. And why do you think they'd be angry at us? We're rocking the boat. The system was supposed to work that way. County's supposed to be the place that takes the uninsured. Let's not mess it up. Because this is what we do. So we did a study and we published it. And we held a press conference. We asked the hospital to help a press conference. And they said, we can't help you. So we, four of us, we were like, just out of residence, she was shaking hands, <laughs> reading a press release that we did ourselves in one room, while the hospital held a, held a counter press conference in the room next to us. I'm, but the reason I tell you all this is this, is speaking up is really hard to do. It's really hard to speak up, even when it's obvious. When you're in the middle of a system that's doing bad things, it's really hard to personally change that, to have the bravery to do it. And when you do it, even your friends will get angry with you and might, might have a counter press conference. <laughs> we published a paper. It's the first time I ever wrote a paper. It was the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and actually, patient dumping ended. I went to Congress, testified before Congress. There was a lot of stuff going on in the country. This is now against the law in the United States to do this. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, because it does happen but it's against the law to do it. <clears throat> it was the first time I realized that deliberate action, using data, using your voice, speaking up, could change something. And that felt pretty good uh, to be able to do that. So now I'm going to talk to you about the death gap. Uh, this is what the, the death gap in where we are right now. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I think people know a lot about it. But the idea that two children can be born and have totally different life experiences in the same city. So, you know, what we know is location, location, location is the most important thing in health. Where you live and who you live by dictates when you die. You can walk into a neighborhood and you can look and you have a good sense of what the life expectancy is in that neighborhood, just how it looks. And uh, this is true, and it's not just what you eat, it's lots of things that are layered in that. And we have two kinds of neighborhoods in America right now, concentrated disadvantage and concentrated advantage. And you can kind of look at these in, in this way, that concentrated advantage, high net worth, Winnetka, think Winnetka, Wait, racially segregated, think white, uh, high community efficacy, we can do anything here, including keeping housing such that no one else can move in. Uh, close hospital and clinic proximity, you know, doctors with fancy offices and all the equipment, everybody with a card. Concentrated disadvantage, high poverty, racially segregated, black, Latino, uh, but it could be white Appalachian, it's not just that, it's not just uh, white and black, but largely low community efficacy, because every time you try to do something, you get beat down. And the hospitals are either far, far away or they're not so good. So, an article you should all read. If you haven't read this article in The Atlantic, it's called The Case for Reparations. It's about Chicago. I'm going to give you a really quick history of what happened in the United States. So, in about uh, after World War I, we decided we didn't want any more white Europeans or any more Asians from China or Japan in the United States. That's what made it really hard for Jews to leave Germany and Poland during World War II because these elements in the United States were foaming left-wing sort of socialism stuff 
and the Congress, in its, in, in its uh, best interest, said, we're going to close off European and Asian immigration to this country. But then you come to the end of the Depression and uh, the, the ramp up to World War II, and suddenly the factories are going, and we needed workers. Who did we need to turn to? Black people and, and Mexican people. And though the people were invited to move to northern cities to work. And what happened is they found neighborhoods unwilling to accept them. And what you ended up having was all kinds of housing problems, uh, uh, unfair housing practices, you name it, demonstrations, riots. There were riots in the cities. And Chicago experienced amazing riots. When you think riots, what do you think? Black people. White people rioting. Anytime a black person moved into the neighborhood, whites would gather in the thousands outside of houses, throwing rocks, burning uh, uh, porches down. The police wouldn't move down the street. This is what really happened in Chicago. And what happened eventually, whites left the suburbs, passed new laws to prevent people to come in there. And you had these black areas of concentrated advantage. And the businesses, the factories moved out as well. Rise of the uninsured in the United States. People without cards now. No, no cards, no jobs, concentrated segregation. And this is the story of the northern cities in the United States and, and a number of southern cities. It's a great article. This says 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of racist housing policy, until we reckon, reckon with our compounding moral debts, America will never be whole. It's a great read, believe it or not. But there's not just more, it's more than just black people here. There are eight Americas in terms of life expectancy and uh, income. And you can see uh, here that you got Appalachian whites, then black middle America, high risk black urban, southern, and you can see different incomes and different male life expectancy here. So there are eight Americas in terms of life expectancy. It, turn, it turns out that being black in, a, in an urban area and being a black male in an urban area is, a, is an early death sentence. That's the fact of America right now. And uh, being Native American uh, isn't so good either and being a rural black. It turns out that if you match blacks and whites by income, that uh, black health is worse. Uh, and it's, uh, as a country, we do worse. And it's, the reason we do worse as a country, so we, we set these goals way back when to end health disparity in this country. And the thing that's keeping us back to reach the national goal of ending health disparity is the uh, death rate, the death gap between black, whites uh, in this country. That's keeping the country from having a better life expectancy rate. And so it's a huge problem. But if we don't address sort of racism as a structural cause of it uh, in a very serious, direct way, we're never going to overcome this. So my friend Steve Whitman, who died this past year, my best friend, and he and I worked together many years, added up in Chicago if there was equality, if there was an equal number, if blacks just had the same chance to live as white people in Chicago, how many black lives would be here each year? 3,200 black deaths, excess black deaths a year in Chicago, just because of lack of equality in our city. And we've let that happen. So I talk about the death gap. I don't call it disparity. I call it debt despair it but not disparity. I call it a death gap because that's what it is. So in Hyde Park, the life expectancy is 84 years old. You know, they want to put the Obama Library between uh, Hyde Park and Washington Park, the next community area over. The next, uh, in Washington Park, the life expectancy is 69 years old. 69 years. So that's a gap. Actually, the largest gaps in Chicago are over 30 years. If you take a, it's at a smaller area, a census tract, to the lowest census tracts, a 30-year gap within miles of each other. You can walk and lose all those years of life expectancy. <clears throat> so a black man on the south side of Chicago will live eight years, uh, will die eight years earlier than U.S. whites. And here's a fact. This was Arlene Geronimus, the American Journal of Public Health. Chance that a 16-year-old black teen on the south, the south side of Chicago will live to the age of 65. 50%. So why is this? Why is this? Audience response. <laughs> Flag. 
Now, what, what's the reason why this is true? So, I do this talk all the time, and I ask the same question, and then the same answer, violence is what we hear. It's not violence. I'm going to say this about it. I think it's all those disparities you about You know what it is? You can go down the list. I was looking at the cause of death. So the real cause, so the, you know, there is a, what the true cause of mortality is, is the spider I was talking about. But, but the, actually, when you look at the causes of death in sort of an epidemiologic way here, I'm not saying violence isn't important, but over half the death here is heart disease and cancer. Diseases for which, if you had clinics, if you had early detection, if you had treatment, if you had grocery store, if you had all of this stuff, you wouldn't have it. But everyone says violence, because that's our own implicit. That's us. We see that. We see a young black man, and, and, and we just have to, have, we have to, we have this reaction. We have to, that's what we have to overcome. We have to say, stop, time out. Think pleasant thoughts. <laughs> so, oh, there's another, there's trauma care in Chicago. This has been a big deal on the south side of Chicago. Uh, people may know this. I think I'm the only uh, adult doctor, I mean adult meaning a serious, a serious guy who's in a high position in Chicago in a healthcare field who's spoken out about this. And the silence is, I mean there have been people who've spoken out at Northwestern and you have seen another place, but no one with any stature or status has spoken out about this. And it's a, it's a big deal. And so Obama cares, UFC does it, no trauma center, no library. Uh, so the issue here is a young 17-year-old who is a, a leader of a group called Fearless Leading Youth was killed and was and bypassed UFC. And it turns out a study from Northwestern shows that you get a penetrating gun wound, that delay is deadly for you. And this is the map of Chicago. And you can see right here is Hyde Park. And look at all the trauma deaths. Wouldn't this be a beautiful location for an adult trauma center if you were designing this? So there's my friend Steve Whitman uh, uh, with, with, the, with the graph that we would take out to churches and show this to women to show them the death gap. And we told them it wasn't biology, because that's what we heard when we first showed this gap in Chicago, uh, uh, that it wasn't biology, it wasn't genes. It was the system that was actually doing this. And we got a lot of pushback. So this was a study that we did that shows the black-white racial mortality gap in Chicago. So if you look at those 3,200 lives, there's 100 of them every year. And what you can see that in 1980, there was no gap. And what happened is things got better in breast cancer screening and treatment. White women uh, did as we would expect, and no one said we've gotten as good as we need to do with breast cancer, but it was as if nothing had happened for black women in Chicago. And when we first put this out, some researchers at the University of Chicago said, well, it was the genes, they have this genetic deficit, and if you Google black in genes, you're going to find a million genetic reasons why black people are having all kinds of problems, but not hardly any that talk about we've created this problem. So there is something called the amenability factor that when some, a cancer is now amenable to treatment, that white people benefit more than black people. And when a cancer is not amenable to treatment, they both die at the same rate. And so this is a, an example of the amenability factor. So as a pushback to this, we decided to show the difference between breast cancer gap in Chicago, which is black, in the United States as a whole, in New York City. And you can see a growing gap in Chicago a uh, growing one in the United States, but New York City, a small gap. And so we asked the question to our critics, what happened to black women's genes when they crossed the Allegheny Mountains? <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but this is a little bit like arguing with Garner, with the critics of Garner, that he wasn't murdered. How much evidence do you need? But this is the world that we're in, and that's why not only have to speak up, you have to be loud, you have to speak up frequently, and it's got to be white people speaking up about this. Okay? I mean, I'm not saying other people shouldn't, but there's got to be white voices speaking out about this and people in leadership. So then we said the map of Chicago. So this is a map of Chicago with the high mortality areas for breast cancer, and we laid on at the hospitals that had 
what were called approved accredited uh, cancer programs. That means they have a seal of quality by the American College of Surgeons. And you can see there are 24 community areas. One here was a white area, Mount Greenwood, uh, that had a higher mortality, very isolated. But you can see the black areas uh, had, this is Mercy uh, Hospital here, but had almost no cancer centers near them. And you say, what's wrong with these women that move into these uh, communities that don't have resources? You can see this is system, this is design, we've created it. Uh, and the literature supports it at every step of the way, racial differences are found and they're systematic. You can find it for just about any disease you want to look for. So this was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine presented to very nice doctors, different clinical scenarios. And what they did is they had a black man, a black woman, a white man, and a white woman, and people got different scenarios. And then they flashed on the screen whether they had insurance or not. And you can imagine that what was recommended, these all had chest pain, what got recommended to them was actually gender and race and insurance biased. This is this unconscious bias. And then when a patient perceives that a doctor or a nurse is biased, what are they going to do? Why do you think there's mistrust? Oh, our patients really mistrust. Yeah, what are we doing to engender this mistrust? I mean, these are lots of published articles on this subject here. So I want to talk now. I'm going to, so if you didn't like part one or part two, <laughs> I'm not so sure how part three is going to be. But, but I, I want this to be a little bit of a commentary on what to do, because I, this is actually hopeful, not hopeless. And, and I've got to tell you why I'm hopeful. It, Susan B. Anthony, if you remember, sure, she got, uh, was one of the suffragettes. She was actually influenced by the abolitionists, by the black abolitionists, that, boy, if we could end slavery, maybe we'd get women the right to vote in this country. And she used to vote in federal elections and get arrested. And so there's a whole, many times, and eventually women got the right to vote and then she got herself on a silver dollar that no one wants to use. But, <laughs> but the, well, the point is, we've seen incredible stuff in this country that we can achieve. But it, but it doesn't occur if we stay silent and don't do it together. So how do we end what I call the despair gap? because that's what we have right now. And I reflect back on to my family and their despair probably in Europe as they were being rounded up by the Nazis with no one to reach out to them. We have a despair gap and it's not up, it's up to us to reach out. Uh, so we went to hospitals in Chicago with this breast cancer stuff and we said, will you share your quality, we think it's the quality of care you're delivering. Will you share your quality data with us and you can imagine me convincing hospitals to share the quality data. We did it confidentially. We created a quality consortium uh, called the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force. You can Google it at www.chicagobreastcancer.org. We went front in front of women, said it's not your fault. The institutions you're going to or may not be providing the kind of quality that you should be getting. Because, and we went to institutions around the city and now around the state. We got state law changed to pay the institutions something to do this. And with the work that we've done, we can show that we've improved the quality of care in these institutions, and we've reduced this gap in disparity now. Uh, the latest data, by it's now 40%, it was 62%. It's still a big gap, it's not down to zero, but we were able to do it because we applied, we said it's the system, and if we fix, so if you think the problem's in the woman, if it's genetic, then we gotta fix the woman, right? But if we think the problem's in the system, then we fix the system. And that's what... When, we're, when we hit the finish line, <laughs> then you can clap, okay? You know, I, I, I run long distance races. It, when, when you're seven miles and you gotta go 13 more, so I say, you can do it, yeah, right. <laughs> So this is, it. this is the gap, and you can see, not since 1999 was the gap this low, but we got to get it down to, we got to get down to zero. Uh, but now we got to do this for everything. So this is where I show you why inequality, inequality is hard, we hate inequality, it's hardwired into us, and uh, we can't tolerate it. And I want to show you, if I can figure this out, maybe not count. Okay. 
I need a little help here. Who's a computer person? <laughs> no, but I can do if I want to. Can I get into, uh, can I get into uh, can I get Yeah, do you have volume? Okay, I want to go on the internet. This is so worth it. <laughs> first realizes 
he gave the rock, or she gave the rock, and didn't get the grape, the first reaction was to tap the rock against the wall. And a little bit said, there must be something wrong with me, right? That's the first thing you have when you're faced with this. It's our own, what happens to us is there must be something wrong with me that I can't get the grape. And uh, you can see even the reaction and the frustration that builds when he doesn't get the grape. It's very funny, but it's also really poignant. So this is uh, uh, Lafayette Rivers. If, uh, the book, There Are No Children Here, did anyone read that book? Uh, Alex Kotlowitz, it really was a, a powerful book and powerful even now. Uh, on one of their romps, uh, Alex asked Lafayette, what do you want to be when you grow up? And Lafayette said, if I grow up, I want to be a bus driver. He was nine years old. This is our job. This is, this is our job. If I grow up, it makes you, it makes you cry uh, that this is the truth of our city. Uh, we can't fix the world, you know, but we can fix the city here. But we've got to do it together. Um, across the street from Cook County Hospital is a statue of Louis Pasteur. On the back of the statue, there's a plaque, and it says this. One doesn't ask of one who suffers, what is your country, what is your religion? I would say, what is your, your color of your skin, your ethnic background, your gender, your sexual preference, or what card you happen to have. One merely says, you suffer, this is enough for me. You belong to me and I should help you. That's why I became a doctor. That's why I do this justice work. That's why I hope you will join in this justice work in the ways that you can. And here's what I think, so one of it is to do the work, but this is the challenge for all of us. So what more can I do to challenge my own implicit racial bias, uh, biases and others, that and others? So if you're sitting around and you hear someone say something, speak up. Teach yourself to speak up. Uncle Joe, Aunt Betty, you hear some randomly, some people say something, speak up. Uh, because learning, practicing to speak up makes you really good when you really need it. What more can I do to challenge this in others? You've got to challenge it in yourself, you've got to challenge it in others. What more can we do to uh, eliminate these biases, the racism that's in our midst, in our neighborhoods, our jails, our schools, our colleges, our healthcare facilities, our city, and our country? Take it personally. You've got to take it personally. You've got to look that when, when something happens to a, uh, an Eric Garner, this is how I feel about it, or uh, uh, any other thing, as if it was your own child, your own brother, your own sister that is happening to, we've got to take it personally and start now. Anyway, thank you, and I'll take <laughs>
uh, male-dominated society still. I, there's, there's, you know, there's lots of problems we have. And so it's incumbent upon first white people to speak up against the, the racism around it. But we all have to speak up, to your point. Steve was my, like I said, my best friend. Is We come from privilege, and we don't really understand how it feels. We can't, but we can only be observers to it. But I think one has to try to find a way to speak up in our own different ways. I mean, I, you know, for me, I was very shy. You can't know it, but now how I am, I taught myself how not to be shy because I was terrified of raising my voice and connect, taking my inside that was fearful and, and speaking. I, I just think, I don't know the answer to, to what you said because I can't put myself in your shoes. What I know for me, coming from privilege, it just, you have to be humble. You have to try to understand and listen. But uh, speaking up is hard for everybody to do. It's, we're we're uh, taught never to speak up, and so it's hard. Another, another, yes? Um, you talk a lot about speaking up, uh, you know, when we witness racism in others or in the systems that we move through. And I wonder if you have any experience um, sort of witnessing it in yourself and checking in on that or, or what, um, what reflections you might be able to offer in, uh, especially for the white folks in the room, checking in with our own kind of implicit biases, as you mentioned earlier. Well, I, I admit I'm a racist. It's like being an alcoholic. You've got to admit that this stuff is so inside of you, it's really hard to overcome. Uh, it's, I'm a sexist as well. I, I really have to think as we have to, for men, is, what is particularly have to be, try to find humility in this and really try to meet people where they are. But it comes out, I see all the time at Rush, for example, uh, in the way that it comes out implicitly. People are more comfortable with their own. Their people are just more comfortable. And there's no criticism about that. People just are comfortable around that. So you have to get out of your comfort zone. There's a, uh, a TED talk where we have to cross over to the side of the road that you don't feel like, that you don't feel comfortable. So I'm going to tell you one of the things that I do, because I think some of this is kind of basic for me. What do I learn? I make sure I say hello to everyone. I try to get to know people's names. I say good morning. I do some really basic things when I walk around the hospital. Like, for example, in a very, very high position. And, and, and but because I think if I walk by someone and don't sit, I may be like, you get up in the morning, so this is, I think I was sort of a, I don't want to stereotype white people here, but I can, you get up in the morning, you're kind of grumpy, you don't say hello to everyone. About noon, you're ready to say hello to people. <laughs> and you walk past somebody who's now, feels diminished inside of them and you can't don't make you can't see that but you could imagine it might be there so saying hello in the morning to someone hey how's it going how's your family I mean I I'm not sure it works but I try to do it through relationship and that's all you can do but another thing too is I think we have a particular problem with black men in this world because and I and I and otherwise we wouldn't have imprisoned so many we wouldn't have kept so many out of medical school and other professions. We have to reach out across black men. So, you know, when you have that, there's a, a famous book called Whistling Vivaldi about Brent Staples, a New York Times reporter, going to U of C grad school. And when he saw white people walking down the street and sensed their discomfort, whistled Vivaldi four seasons, because it would make, it would be counter stereotype. But, but actually what white people need to do is walk across the street and say, hey, good afternoon, how are you? Uh, are you new to the neighborhood? My name is, right? Because we operate out of so much fear that's been embedded on us. You know, we, people grow up in white communities, they're segregated, there's fear, it's promulgated on the news and the media, we've heard it in our families, we've heard racist comments, and so now you go walk to your first job, you know, you're going to hire a black man? No. You won't have it in you to do it. I, I'm not sure I answered your question, but yes? Um, well, first of all, I think you've probably activated more than three people to take action today, I hope. Um, but there's an important election coming up soon in Chicago. And I, and in some ways, I think Chicago's made a lot of headway as far as um, what we've done in health, and in some ways um, we're probably uh, taking steps back or just staying the same. Do you have 
thoughts about the direction that we need to go and what candidate might take us there? Yes, but I won't say it here. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, um, based on what you said today, my mind has just shifted my perceptions. Um, because in early days, in the 80s, um, a lot of black people that I was around, and I've worked in black communities for a long time, they believed that Cook County had the best doctors. So, I'm wondering, was that out of perception because they had, they had been dumped there, or is this a reality? We talked about this a lot, because, okay, I went to medical school, I'm 26 years old, I'm a doctor in Cook County without any supervision. I mean, data, am I the best doctor? <laughs> right? It, it can't be true, right? But what were we? We were, we real, we were in uh, strangers in a strange land, and so we went there with hearts. I, I tell the story of my book, County, my first patient. I was so ready. Um, health is a human right. We're going to come fight the battles for health care equity in Chicago. You know, we're going to learn to become doctors on the front line of Chicago. I was dressed like a lumberjack. You know, I had, you know, those days I said, no white coats. They're not good. My hair was like shaggy like this. I had an Army Navy belt that said U.S. on it with my ophthalmoscope on it. I go to see my first patient as a, as a as an elderly African-American woman up on a stretcher and she has heart failure and she's leaning and I said, hi, I'm Dr. Anderson, I'm going to be your doctor. She looks at the nurse who's an African-American and said, I ain't going to let that little white boy boycott me. <laughs> <laughs> what we had, what we learned was to listen to our patients and hear them and hear what they were saying. We weren't the best doctors. But we didn't, we treated patients differently. And I'm not sure we all did, but I'm saying, but people's experience in every other place was being turned away, racist, uh, I mean, overt frank racism, or even then subtle racism, or just, I don't feel comfortable here. And what we did was try to listen and be humble, which is all you can be. And no one, we modeled after the next guy, because we didn't know how to do it, but we listened, we were humble, we had potlucks together, we got to know people, and it was very, but we weren't the best. We were the best compared to what was going on outside there for people. Yes? I'd like to piggyback on that. One yes. of my dearest friends uh, who went, was a resident in Cook County as well, and while he was going through that process that and finished, I said, well, how do you, like, and he goes, we are the best doctors. He's like, and that's why I laughed, you know, joking. And he said, no, we are. He said, because we get sent everything that none of the other hospitals in the city will handle. So as a surgeon and learning to be a surgeon, I get everything, and I know how to handle myself in any situation. Yeah. So some of that reputation or that thing. Yeah, I, I will say there was that part of it, too. You did learn, you, because of it, because it was such a concentrating place. Yet you learn, but you know, one of the things you had to learn is you had to be really good at this if you're going to be, uh, uh, you, you, if you're going to be an activist for social justice, you better be pretty good. You better be a pretty good priest to start with, right? <laughs> because otherwise, uh, you, you can't get there. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to offer like an additional resource in terms of combating or challenging certain implicit biases or subconscious yes. biases. So, I was reading um, an article a couple of months ago out of the Harvard Business Review about um, the psychological concept of mindfulness. And so taking that into consideration when you're engaging with folks and rather than having sort of evaluations of them based on what you see in the media or past experiences, et cetera, influence how you approach that person, um, focusing on the moment. So focusing on that person not relying on those sort of past experiences to kind of inform your dialogue with them. Yeah, so that again across like race and gender and sexual orientation, class, all that down stuff like helps it. You can just stay in the moment and focus on the person that in front of you. That's really good advice. You know, I just think we have to do it. I mean, I don't like everyone's asking, well, how do you do it? We just have to do it. We're just people, for God's sakes. You know, and but I think that that's a really that's really good advice. I'll take one more question. How about that? Back there. Yeah. Um, thank you. I feel bad because he's a Rush resident, so now I'm going to take two questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much do you think uh, a, a huge structural change, like a single payer system or a national health service, what would that do to change some of these inequities? Oh, I think it would do a lot. 
but it won't do all of it. See, racism, if we don't attack the, 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 the uh, legacy of racism in this country, and other things too, the isms, we don't attack those, the card itself won't uh, overcome it, but I'm a big single payer fan. Uh, and the, the, so one of the things that's been is great is choice. Do you know what I mean? So one of the things that I notice about so when you get these, uh, the, say breast cancer, the hospital in the community has become so devalued because people haven't had insurance, and they can't get insurance because they're not jobs. And so the care that's provided isn't as good. But at least if you had a card that lets you go anywhere, you could actually get to the better place. So single payer is great because it allows you choice and allows you the same benefit package, rich, poor, black, white, old, young. And I'll tell you one of the reasons I think we don't have a single payer in this country is because this country has never wanted to give the benefits to the other. And the other being, and, and so I'll give you an example, when Social Security first uh, came in in 1935 or whatever it is, do you know who we left out? Domestic and what else? Agricultural. agricultural. And who were domestic workers? And who were agricultural workers? Mexicans and blacks, right? I, we have never wanted to give equal to the other. And that's why I think we have to attack, we, white men, have to attack our own privilege. We have to live with the humility, but we have to attack it because I think single payer itself is important, but I don't think it's going to overcome all of this, all of the, the gaps here. I'm going to take my Rush resident. Hi. Um, you talk about when you were an intern. I'm uh, an intern at Rush right now. I work at County and Rush, and it doesn't sound that it's that different. And there's still a huge disparity there. And I just want to know why it hasn't changed more, and if you see us achieving more equity, and if we can really see that in our lives. Uh, I wrote County. The reason I wrote the book County is I got to Rush, and I couldn't believe it, because I've been at County for 17 years, Mount Sinai for 10, and then Rush, and I'm the chief medical officer. My patients came with me, and I call it three hospitals, one street, two worlds. The palpable inequality in our midst, and people are driving by and not seeing it, just like black imprisonment. We're, 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 we're not paying attention to it. So it exists because we allow it to exist. We exist because we pretend that it's equal when it's not equal. Uh, we, it, we, it exists because we don't have a single payer system, you know, where people go to the card, go with anywhere. And it, we, al we allow it, and we have to, we have to break it down. Um, it's a, not, not an easy answer. Oh, yes, please. I, <laughs> I just want to give a testimonial. Sometimes people see people where they are, and they forget where they came from. But Dr. Ansel and I worked together at Cook County back in 1980. Hey, in the emergency but, but you were you stay so young. <laughs> he didn't recognize me. How was I back then? <laughs> he didn't recognize me, but it was before uh, yo, both of us got you. great hair and all of this. And he has always been an advocate for health care. He's always been an advocate for the needy. So the way he is at Rush, he was that way at Cook County years and years ago. We loved him. We'd be rushing trying to get the patients that got transferred there to trauma or wherever they need to go. And he'd come back and say, Okay, Giles, what did it say on there about the transfer? You know, and he was looking for us to say the reasons. I would say no insurance, but we were so busy trying to get patients where they belong. But he has always been into research. He's always been there for the people who were on the lower end. So I really applaud you, and I'm so glad you had Rush, but you're still making big improvements. Yeah. Miss Giles. <laughs> Ms. Giles taught me the most important thing about being a doctor, that a doctor's uh, orders are worthless without a nurse to carry them out. <laughs>